Hey, this is Lloyd Pierce, pastor of Encounter Church Belito. I hope this message inspires you, and I hope it activates something on the inside of you to do great things for God. Enjoy the message. Say with me the irreversible blessing. Let's go to Numbers chapter number 22 from verse 1. And bear with me, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit and... uh, I need to open up my Bible for this. Okay, Numbers chapter number 22 from verse number 1. So we have the story of Balak and Balaam. Uh, Balak was the king of the Moabites at the time. If you know me, I like history. I hope you do too. If you don't, I'm going to bore you with a little bit of background, okay? Otherwise, the names Balak and Balaam are going to cause you to get squint-eyed. I know the history and I got a bit squint-eyed. So remember, Balak was the king. He was the king of the Moabites, okay? Then you have Balaam, which was basically a prophet for hire. Are you okay? Sometimes not necessarily in a bad sense, but people would come to him when they would inquire of the Lord, even uh, uh, ungodly nations like the Moabites, Okay? They would inquire of him and he would, and they would pay him, the Bible says, a divinest fee. They literally had to pay him. Okay? Oh, damn. That's going to, okay. It's fine. I'm not a prophet, so I can say those things. When Saul lost his donkeys, they went to the prophet Samuel to inquire of the Lord, where are the donkeys? What did the servants say? We cannot go to the prophet empty-handed. Okay, uh, maybe I'm going to lose you if I go down that road. So let's just stay here. So we have Balak and Balaam. Balak is the king. Balaam is the prophet for hire. So I'm just going to read. Stay with me. So verse 1 says, Then the children of Israel moved and encamped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. Oh, say, let it be so for me. Imagine your enemies get sick with dread. Mm. Man, that guy's getting all the business contracts. He's making me sick. Hallelujah. I receive. (laughs) So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us. As an ox licks up the grass of the fields. Yes, they were so dramatic, yeah, eh? And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at the time, like I said. Then he sent messages to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land, the sons of this people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt, meaning the Israelites came out of Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth. That is dramatic. It's a small earth that three million people covered it. And are settling next to me. These guys are in trouble. Therefore, please come at once. Curse this people, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whom you bless is blessed. And whom you curse is cursed. So... Balak Balak acknowledges that Balaam has a connection with God, that when he speaks, he is a true prophet, because when he says someone is blessed, they are blessed, and when he says someone is cursed, they are cursed, and so Balak goes to Balaam, the prophet, and he says to him, please come help me here, this nation is giving me troubles, I need to defeat them, the only way that I'm going to defeat them is if you curse them, are you with me? Okay, good. I'm glad you're with me so far. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the divinest fee, there we go, in their hands. And they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. 
Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them. Look at verse number 12. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Hmm. Say the blessing is unstoppable. The blessing is irrevocable. The blessing is irreversible. Meaning that once you are blessed, you cannot be cursed. The Bible says that a curse without cause shall not alight. Meaning that in the new covenant that you are blessed. Jesus became a curse for you. So every curse that comes your way, I don't care what they say to you. It has no cause. Because you are blessed. You think, you give, you give, firstly, firstly witchcraft. Okay? Let's not even get into, uh, you, you think that your boss or someone that spoke to you badly in school and said you will never amount to anything and you are useless and you think that those words have power? Those words have no power over you. Those curses have no power over you. You think some Sangoma going to come and throw her little bones here by me and she's going to have power? I will literally laugh at you. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, or oh, let's go here. So they have this debate. Balaam and Balak back and forth. Please curse the people. I can't curse the people. God has said, I can't curse the people. Go back to your land. The Lord has refused me to go, to go with you. So now go with me to, um, to verse number 22. So eventually, through this tussle, Balaam gives in. Uh, it's 20, yeah, verse number 22. Balaam gives in and he says, okay, I'm going to make my way down to... Um, I'm going to make my way down to Balak, okay? And so you have here, from verse 22 onwards, the story takes a turn, and this is where the famous part where the donkey speaks, okay, in the Bible. Uh, and you have the angel of the Lord who stands in front of the, the, the donkey and in front of Balaam and doesn't let him pass all the time. So it's actually the angel that is getting in Balaam's way, okay, and Balaam gets upset with the donkey. So he hits the donkey. <laughs> he hits the poor donkey three times along this, from verse 22 to 28. It's funny he hits it three times. It's a, it's a picture of Jesus. Um, um, it's a picture of Jesus. He was three years in the ministry. He endured three significant trials, and he was resurrected on the third day. Isn't it amazing that, that they would use that, the fact that the donkey was struck three times. Put that image on for me of the donkey. Do you know that the donkey is the only animal, if you look at it, when Jesus came and he rode into Jerusalem on the back. Look on that back. What is that? It's a cross. Do you think that that's coincidence? Do you think it's coincidence that even in this story, it would be a donkey that would speak? Meaning that the cross will speak on your behalf. Oh, I don't know if you received it. I said the cross will speak on your behalf. You don't have to fight. This donkey is there and the prophet is striking him. And eventually, uh, endued with uh, some uh, supernatural speech, he looks at him and says, what's your problem? Why did you hit me three times? And Balaam catches a wake up and realizes he's having a conversation with an animal. And he doesn't know if he's hearing from the Lord or from the devil. I pray that your dog speak to you and make you catch a wake up. So he says, what have I done to you that you have struck me three times? Verse 28. Then it goes on. So he eventually heeds, I'm giving you the story, are you still with me? So he eventually heeds Balaam, uh, Balak, and Balaam goes, and he has this encounter with the Lord. 
God did not want to go. God did not want him to go. First he says no, prophet disobeys. Then he says, okay, put an angel in the way. Blind prophet doesn't check the angel. He says, now I have to make the donkey speak. He makes the donkey speak, still does not listen. Disobedient prophets. Just because they hear from the Lord, it doesn't mean that they're going to obey what he says. So you have all of this. And then now he gets near to uh, uh, Balak. So you go to verse 41. So it was the next day that Balak took Balaam. So now Balaam ended up in Balak's presence. And brought him up the high places of Baal. This is the same mountain where the showdown went. With Elijah and the prophets of Baal. That there he might observe the extent of the people. Uh, chapter number 23. Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. So they do an offering. They're trying to uh, conjure up the Lord. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Uh, it says, the Bible says, God told Balaam that he cannot curse this people because they are blessed. Even if you have an enemy that comes up with some conjuring, trying to persuade the Lord with an offering, it's not going to work. You cannot fight grace and win. I said you cannot fight grace and win. It is a losing battle for you. You can do whatever you want. You can fast. You can pray. You can put an offering. You can curse. You can even try and bless God, I'm saying. He's not going to listen to you. Because whoever is blessed cannot be cursed. Then Balaam said to Balak, verse number 3, Stand by your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me. Hey, Balaam's starting to lose hope here. And whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height. And God met Balaam. And he said to him, I have prepared the seven altars and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. So there was a protocol. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak and thus you shall speak. Balaam did not know what that word was yet. He put it in his mouth. Oftentimes when we prophesy over people, we don't know what that word is yet. You get different realms. You get Nabi prophecy and you get seer. Seer prophecy will be uh, sometimes, it, you know, a lot of people say you're a seer prophet or you're a Nebai prophet. You can operate in both. Uh, specifically, people that see, you will literally see something. You can see a donkey, for example. Or I can see a house with uh, painted pink on the outside. Whatever it is, you're a seer. But a Nebai, God puts the words in your mouth and immediately as you... I might just have an unction to go and prophesy over a person. The minute that I call them out and I'm obedient to that first, Nabba means a bubbling up. So it bubbles out. So that's what's happening to Balaam at this moment. He doesn't know what that word is. He's thinking, ah, oh, finally, Lord, the Lord going to let me curse these people. Sorry. So we have, then go from uh, verse number six. So he returned to him, and they were standing by his burnt offering, and he had all the princes of Moab. And he took up his oracle and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come coast Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. Verse number 8. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For, for from the tops of the rocks I see him. Now, let me explain something else to you. What do I say about the donkey? That the cross will work on your behalf. Now you have Balak and Balaam are situated on the top of the mountain. Can I show you what? They see Israel. They see the camp of Israel. You know that Israel got specific instructions of the way that they must situate themselves. Do you know this? You to the east and this camp there and that camp there. This is what they saw from the top of the mountain. Put that image on. Oh man, 
I love the Bible so much. They're standing there on the top. And now you have Balak, this ungodly king. He says, please look upon these people and curse them. Good luck, my brother. I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing. Meaning, Balaam is a prophet. So he has some sense of the future and of God's plan. And he looks down and he says, how am I supposed to curse these people? There is a covenant that is going to be established. They are literally prophesying the covenant of the cross right over there. The cross, anyone related to the cross, any symbolic around the cross, anyone who aligns themselves with the cross is blessed. I cannot curse these people. For when I see them, I don't see them. All I see is Jesus on the cross. I see His blood shed for them. I see righteousness poured out upon them. I see all godly benefits put on them. How can I curse this people? So you have the donkey gets in the way. The cross will speak for you. Mm. And then over here, even if your enemies want to come against you, just by you standing firm, what were they? They were positioned. I don't know if you're getting me tonight. They were positioned at the cross. Holding your position at the cross ensures that your blessing remains and that nothing and no curse shall be able to touch you. Hmm. So he sees Israel from there. He cannot touch them. Now go with me to uh, quickly to verse number 11. They eventually get there. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies. And look, you have blessed them bountifully. Meaning that you had an assignment, Balaam. You were supposed to come here, look down upon these people and curse them. First, God says to them, you cannot, be, you cannot curse them because they are blessed. So they're already blessed. By the time, Balaam, you go there to them, they're already blessed. But now they are blessed bountifully. Say, I am blessed bountifully. Whenever someone tries to come against you, whenever an enemy tries to come against you to curse you, the only thing that can happen is that you will enter a new degree of blessing. You will go from being blessed to being blessed bountifully. Mm. Mm. If you are blessed, you cannot be cursed. Let every word that intended to harm you turn out to bless you. They were already blessed, but now he blessed them bountifully. May you move from being blessed to being bountifully blessed. Say bountifully blessed. Mm. This is a good word. Go with me to verse 20. This is I, where I want to land. I'm so early, ne? Then Balak said to Balaam, Oh no, where are we now? Okay. This is Balaam now talking to him. He says, Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Say the irreversible blessing. The blessing is irreversible. The blessing is irrevocable. Mm. He has blessed and I cannot reverse it. That's why the Bible says, Whom God has blessed, no man shall curse. If I can get one thing into you today, know that you are blessed. Know that there is nothing that, come, that can come against you that can take away that blessing. In fact, the opposite. Any suggestion of the enemy that will try and come. Maybe it's a suggestion at your job. Oh, but I... But, I, uh, uh, um, but it looks like this threat is going to come. And I've been toiling for so long. Maybe I'm just cursed. No, if that threat of curse comes upon you, it just means that you're going to enter a new level of blessing. That's all it means. You're going to move from being blessed to being blessed bountifully. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. 
So why could he not curse them? Because he saw the cross. He's standing at the top of the mountain and he's seeing Israel and he, all he sees is the cross. He could not curse them because in the old covenant you had blessing and curses. So if they looked and they were in a, maybe in a different arrangement, he was able to curse them. Because you had blessing and curses in the Old Testament. There was the ability to curse. Only in the new covenant there are no such thing as curses. So he looked and he saw a new covenant. And he said, nope, there's a cross over there, sorry. These guys, I cannot curse them. When I look at them, all I see is a new covenant. I only see blessing. May when, when, <laughs> may when they look at you, all they see is a blessing upon you. Say there are no curses upon my life. Only blessings. Mm. Mm. Galatians three thirteen. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Meaning that when Balaam stood on that mountain and he looked. He saw Jesus, that they became, that he became a curse for them. For it says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Number four, uh, verse number 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Meaning that the reason that he became a curse for you is so that you can receive the blessing of Abraham. Amen. Amen. I had the five things that the blessing will do for you. I don't think I'm going to do that. I think we should do some ministry. Amen. Amen. So won't you stand with me? Just stand with me. I said I was going to pray for every single person that is a businessman or woman, all the business people in the church, I want to pray for you specifically. Tonight, God gave me an instruction to do that, uh, to impart the blessing that is upon my life to you, that flows from the head, the oil. It is a realm and a dimension. Let me say it like this. You will be able to enter, if you catch this revelation, you don't need my... You don't need my hands laid on your head. But it's a nice kickstart. <laughs> if I can say it like that. It might take some time for you to take this revelation and catch it. But if I lay my hands upon your head, the blessing will work for you. Instantaneously. Say instantaneously. So all those that are... Thank you for joining us. And special thanks to those of you who give generously to this ministry. It's because of you that this ministry is possible. You can click the link in the description to give now or visit encounterchurchbelito.co.za forward slash give for more information. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to it and share it with your friends. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.